Visions of the Night by Ambrose Bierce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devin Kemp. Visions of the Night by Ambrose Bierce. I hold the belief that the gift of dreams is a valuable literary endowment, that if by some art not now understood the elusive fancies that it supplies could be caught and fixed and made to serve, we should have a literature exceeding fair. In captivity and domestication, the gift could doubtless be wonderfully improved as animals bred to service acquire new capacities and powers. By taming our dreams, we shall double our working hours, and our most fruitful labor will be done in sleep. Even as matters are, dreamland is a tributary province, as witness Kubla Khan. What is a dream? A loose and lawless collocation of memories, a disorderly succession of matters once present in the waking consciousness. It is a resurrection of the dead, pell-mell, ancient and modern, the just and unjust, springing from their cracked tombs, each in his habit, as he lived, pressing forward confusedly to have an audience of the master of the revel, and snatching one another's garments as they run. Master? No. He has abdicated his authority, and they have their will of him. His own is dead, and does not rise with the rest. His judgment, too, is gone and with it the capacity to be surprised. Pained as he may be, and pleased, terrified and charmed, but wonder he cannot feel. The monstrous, the preposterous, the unnatural, these all are simple, right and reasonable. The ludicrous does not amuse, nor the impossible amaze. The dreamer is your only true poet. He is of imagination all compact. Imagination is merely memory. Try to imagine something that you have never observed, experienced, heard of, or read about. Try to conceive an animal for example, without body, head, limbs, or tail, a house without walls or roof. But when awake, having assistance of will and judgment, we can somewhat control and direct. We can pick and choose from memory's store, taking that which serves, excluding, though sometimes with difficulty, what is not to the purpose. Asleep, our fancies inherit us. They come so grouped, so blended, and compounded, the one with another, so wrought of one another's elements, that the whole seems new. But the old familiar units of conception are there, and none beside. Waking or sleeping, we get from imagination nothing new, but new adjustments. The stuff that dreams are made on has been gathered by the physical senses and stored in memory, as squirrels hoard nuts. But one, at least, of the senses contributes nothing to the fabric of the dream. No one ever dreamed an odor. Sight, hearing, feeling, possibly taste, 
are all workers making provision for our nightly entertainment. But sleep is without a nose. It surprises that those keen observers, the ancient poets, did not so describe the drowsy god, and that their obedient servants, the ancient sculptors, did not so represent him. Perhaps these latter worthies, working for posterity, reasoned that time and mischance would inevitably revise their work in this regard, conforming it to the facts of nature. Who can so relate a dream that it shall seem one? No poet has so light a touch. As well try to write the music of an Aeolian harp. There is a familiar species of the genus Bore, Penetrator intolerabilis, who, having read a story, perhaps by some master of style, is at the pains elaborately to expound its plot for your edification and delight. Then thinks, good soul, that now you need not read it. Under substantially similar circumstances and conditions, as the interstate commerce law hath it, I should not be guilty of the like offence, but I propose herein to set forth the plots of certain dreams of my own, the circumstances and conditions being, as I conceive, dissimilar in this, that the dreams themselves are not accessible to the reader. In endeavoring to make record of their poorer parts, I do not indulge the hope of a higher success. I have no salt to put upon the tale of a dream's elusive spirit. I was walking at dusk through a great forest of unfamiliar trees, whence and whither I did not know. I had a sense of the vast extent of the wood, a consciousness that I was the only living thing in it. I was obsessed by some awful spell in expiation of a forgotten crime committed, as I vaguely surmised, against the sunrise. Mechanically and without hope, I moved under the arms of the giant trees along a narrow trail penetrating the haunted solitudes of the forest. I came at length to a brook that flowed darkly and sluggishly across my path and saw that it was blood. Turning to the right, I followed it up a considerable distance and soon came to a small, circular opening in the forest, filled with a dim, unreal light by which I saw in the center of the opening a deep tank of white marble. It was filled with blood, and the stream that I had followed up was its outlet. All round the tank, between it and the enclosing forest, a space of perhaps ten feet in breadth, paved with immense slabs of marble, were the dead bodies of men. A score. Though I did not count them, I knew that the number had some significant and pretentious relation to my crime. Possibly they marked the time, in centuries, since I had committed it. I only recognized the fitness of the number and knew it without counting. The bodies were naked and arranged symmetrically around the central tank, radiating from it like spokes of a wheel. The feet were outward, the heads hanging over the edge of the tank. Each lay upon its back, its throat cut, blood slowly dripping from the wound. 
I looked on all this unmoved. It was a natural and necessary result of my offense, and it did not affect me. But there was something that filled me with apprehension and terror. A monstrous pulsation beating with a slow, inevitable recurrence. I do not know which of the senses it addressed, or if it made its way to the consciousness through some avenue unknown to science and experience. The pitiless regularity of this vast rhythm was maddening. I was conscious that it pervaded the entire forest, and was a manifestation of some gigantic and implacable malevolence. Of this dream, I have no further recollection, probably overcome by a terror which doubtless had its origin in the discomfort of an impeded circulation, I cried out and was awakened by the sound of my own voice. The dream whose skeleton I shall now present occurred in my early youth. I could not have been more than sixteen. I am considerably more now. Yet I recall the incidents as vividly as when the dream was of an hour's age. And I lie cowering beneath the bed covering and trembling with terror from the memory. I was alone on a boundless level in the night. In my bad dreams, I am always alone and it is usually night. No trees were anywhere in sight no habitations of men, no streams, nor hills. The earth seemed to be covered with a short, coarse vegetation that was black and stubbly, as if the plain had been swept by fire. My way was broken here and there, as I went forward with I know not what purpose, by small pools of water occupying shallow depressions, as if the fire had been succeeded by rain. These pools were on every side, and kept vanishing and appearing again, as dark, heavy clouds drove athwart these parts of the sky which they neglected, and passing on disclosed again the steely glitter of the stars in whose cold light the waters shone with a black luster. My course lay toward the west, where low along the horizon burned a crimson light beneath long strips of cloud, giving that effect of measureless distance that I have since learned to look for in Doré's pictures where every touch of his hand has laid a portent and a curse. As I moved, I saw outlined against this uncanny background a silhouette of battlements and towers, which, expanding with every mile of my journey, grew at last to an unthinkable height and breadth, till the building subtended a wide angle of vision, yet seemed no nearer than before. Heartless and hopeless, I struggled on over the blasted and forbidding plain, and still the mighty structure grew until I could no longer compass it with a look, and its towers shut out the stars directly overhead. Then, I passed in at an open portal, between columns of cyclopean masonry, whose single stones were larger than my father's house. Within all was vacancy. Everything was coated with the dust of desertion. A dim light, the lawless light of dreams, sufficient unto itself, enabled me to pass from corridor to corridor and from room to room, 
every door yielding to my hand. In the rooms, it was a long walk from wall to wall. Of no corridor did I ever reach an end. My footfalls gave out that strange, hollow sound that is never heard but in abandoned dwellings and tenanted tombs. For hours I wandered in this awful solitude, conscious of a seeking purpose, yet knowing not what I sought. At last, in what I conceived to be an extreme angle of the building, I entered a room of the ordinary dimensions, having a single window. Through this, I saw the same crimson light still lying along the horizon in the measureless reaches of the west, like a visible doom, and knew it for the lingering fire of eternity. Looking upon the red menace of its sullen and sinister glare, there came to me the dreadful truth, which years later, as an extravagant fancy, I endeavored to express in verse. Man is long ages dead in every zone. The angels all are gone to graves unknown. The devils, too, are cold enough at last, and God lies dead before the great white throne. The light was powerless to dispel the obscurity of the room, and it was some time before I discovered, in the farthest angle, the outlines of a bed, and approached it with a prescience of ill. I felt that here, somehow, the bad business of my adventure was to end with some horrible climax, yet could not resist the spell that urged me to the fulfillment. Upon the bed, partly clothed, lay the dead body of a human being. It lay upon its back, the arms straight along the sides. By bending over it, which I did with loathing, but no fear, I could see that it was dreadfully decomposed. The ribs protruded from the leathern flesh. Through the skin of the sunken belly could be seen the protuberances of the spine. The face was black and shriveled, and the lips, drawn away from the yellow teeth, cursed it with a ghastly grin. A fullness under the closed lids seemed to indicate that the eyes had survived the general wreck, and this was true, for as I bent above them, they slowly opened and gazed into mine with a tranquil, steady regard. Imagine my horror how you can. No words of mine can assist the conception. The eyes were my own. That vestigial fragment of a vanished race, that unspeakable thing which neither time nor eternity had wholly effaced, that hateful and abhorrent scrap of mortality, still sentient after death of God and the angels was I. There are dreams that repeat themselves. Of this class is one of my own, which seems sufficiently singular to justify its narration, though truly I fear the reader will think the realms of sleep are anything but a happy hunting ground for my night-wandering soul. This is not true. The greater number of my incursions into dreamland, and I suppose those of most others, are attended with the happiest results. My imagination returns to the body like a bee to the hive, loaded with spoil which, reason assisting, is transmuted to honey and stored away in the cells of memory to be a joy forever. But 
the dream which I am about to relate has a double character. It is strangely dreadful in the experience, but the horror it inspires is so ludicrously disproportionate to the one incident producing it that in retrospection the fantasy amuses. I am passing through an open glade in a thinly wooded country. Through the belt of scattered trees that bound the irregular space, there are glimpses of cultivated fields and the homes of strange intelligences. It must be near daybreak, for the moon, nearly as full, is low in the west, showing blood red through the mists with which the landscape is fantastically freaked. The grass under my feet is heavy with dew, and the whole scene is that of a morning in early summer, glimmering in the unfamiliar light of a setting full moon. Near my path is a horse, visibly and audibly cropping the herbage. It lifts its head as I am about to pass, regards me motionless for a moment, then walks toward me. It is milky white, mild of mien, and amiable in look. I say to myself, this horse is a gentle soul, and pause to caress it. It keeps its eyes fixed upon my own, approaches and speaks to me in a human voice, with human words. This does not surprise but terrifies, and instantly I return to this, our world. The horse always speaks my own tongue, but I never know what it says. I suppose I vanish from the land of dreams before it finishes expressing what it has in mind, leaving it, no doubt, as greatly terrified by my sudden disappearance as I by its manner of accosting me. I would give value to know the purpose of its communication. Perhaps some morning I shall understand and return no more to this our world. End of Visions of the Night Recording by Devin Kemp, Berlin, Germany, devinkemp.com The Woman of the Satyr by Jerome K. Jerome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rafe Ball the Woman of the Satyr by Jerome K. Jerome Wild reindeer stalking is hardly so exciting a sport as the evening's veranda talk in Norway hotels would lead the trustful traveller to suppose. Under the charge of your guide, a very young man with the dreamy, wistful eyes of those who live in valleys, you leave the farmstead early in the forenoon, arriving towards twilight at the desolate hut which for so long as you remain upon the uplands, will be your somewhat cheerless headquarters. Next morning, in the chill, mist-laden dawn, you rise, and, after a breakfast of coffee and dried fish, shoulder your Remington and step forth silently into the raw, damp air, the guide locking the door behind you, the key grating harshly in the rusty lock. For hour after hour, you toil over the steep, stony ground, or wind through the pines, speaking in whispers, lest your voice reach the quick ears of your prey that keeps its head ever pressed against the wind. Here and there, in the hollows of the hills, lie wide fields of snow, over which you pick your steps thoughtfully, listening to the smothered thunder of the torrent tunnelling its way beneath your feet, and wondering whether the frozen arch above it be at all points as firm as is desirable. Now and again, 
As in single file you walk cautiously along some jagged ridge, you catch glimpses of the green world three thousand feet below you. Though you gaze not long upon the view, for your attention is chiefly directed to watching the footprints of the guide, lest by deviating to the right or left you find yourself at one stride back in the valley, or, to be more correct, are found there. These things you do, and, as exercise, they are healthful and invigorating. But a reindeer you never see, and unless, overcoming the prejudices of your British-bred conscience, you care to take an occasional pop at a fox, you had better have left your rifle at the hut, and, instead, have brought a stick which would have been helpful, notwithstanding which the guide continues sanguine, and in broken English, helped out by stirring gesture, tells of the terrible slaughter generally done by sportsmen under his superintendence, and of the vast herds that generally infest these fields, and when you grow sceptical upon the subject of rains, he whispers alluringly of bears. Once in a way you will come across a track, and will follow it breathlessly for hours, and it will lead to a sheer precipice. Whether the explanation is suicide, or a reprehensible tendency on the part of the animal towards practical joking, you are left to decide for yourself. Then, with many rough miles between you and your rest, you abandon the chase. But I speak from personal experience merely. All day long we had tramped through the pitiless rain, stopping only for an hour at noon to eat some dried venison and smoke a pipe beneath the shelter of an overhanging cliff. Soon afterwards Michael knocked over a riper, a bird that will hardly take the trouble to hop out of your way, with his gun barrel, which incident cheered us a little, and, later on, our flagging spirits were still further revived by the discovery of apparently very recent deer tracks. These we followed, forgetful, in our eagerness, of the lengthening distance back to the hut, of the fading daylight, of the gathering mist. The track led us higher and higher, farther and farther into the mountains, until on the shores of a desolate rock-bound van it abruptly ended, and we stood staring at one another, and the snow began to fall. Unless in the next half hour we could chance upon a satyr, this meant passing the night upon the mountain. Michael and I looked at the guide, but though, with characteristic Norwegian sturdiness, he put a bold face upon it, we could see that in that deepening darkness he knew no more than we did. Wasting no time on words, we made straight for the nearest point of descent, knowing that any human habitation must be far below us. Down we scrambled, heedless of torn clothes and bleeding hands, the darkness pressing closer round us. Then, suddenly, it became black, black as pitch, and we could only hear each other. Another step might mean death. We stretched out our hands and felt each other. Why we spoke in whispers, I do not know, but we seemed afraid of our own voices. We agreed there was nothing for it but to stop where we were till morning clinging to the short grass. So we lay there, side by side, for what may have been five minutes, or may have been an hour. Then, attempting to turn, I lost my grip and rolled. I made convulsive efforts to clutch the ground, but the incline was too steep. How far I fell, I, I could not say, but at last something stopped me. I felt it cautiously with my foot. It did not yield, so I twisted myself round and touched it with my hand. It seemed planted firmly in the earth. I passed my arm along to the right, then to the left. I shouted with joy. It was a fence. Rising and groping about me, I found an opening and passed through, and crept forward with palms outstretched until I touched the logs of a hut, then, feeling my way round, discovered the door and knocked. There came no response, so I knocked louder, then pushed, and the heavy woodwork yielded, groaning. But the darkness within was even darker than the darkness without. The others had contrived to crawl down and join me. Michael struck a wax vesta and held it up, and slowly the room came out of the darkness and stood round us. Then something rather startling happened. 
Giving one swift glance about him, our guide uttered a cry and rushed out into the night. We followed to the door and called after him, but only a voice came to us out of the blackness, and the only words we could catch, shrieked back in terror, were, Satyr Fronen! Satyr Fronen! The women of the Satyr. Some foolish superstition about the place, I suppose, said Michael. In these mountain solitudes, men breed ghosts for company. Let us make a fire. Perhaps, when he sees the light, his desire for food and shelter may get the better of his fears. We felt about the small enclosure round the house, and gathered juniper and birch twigs, and kindled a fire upon the open stove built in the corner of the room. Fortunately, we had some dried reindeer and bread in our bag, and on that and the riper and the contents of our flasks we supped. Afterwards, to while away the time, we made an inspection of the strange eyrie we had lighted on. It was an old log-built satyr. Some of these mountain farmsteads are as old as the stone ruins of other countries. Carvings of strange beasts and demons were upon its blackened rafters, and on the lintel, in runic letters, ran this legend. Hund builded me in the days of Harfaga. The house consisted of two large apartments. Originally, no doubt, these had been separate dwellings standing beside one another, but they were now connected by a long, low gallery. Most of the scanty furniture was almost as ancient as the walls themselves, but many articles of a comparatively recent date had been added. All was now, however, rotting and falling into decay. The place appeared to have been deserted suddenly by its last occupants. Household utensils lay as they were left, rust and dirt encrusted on them. An open book, limp and mildewed, lay face downwards on the table, while many others were scattered about both rooms, together with much paper, scored with faded ink. The curtains hung in shreds about the windows. A woman's cloak, of an antiquated fashion, drooped from a nail behind the door. In an oak chest, we found a tumbled heap of yellow letters. They were of various dates, extending over a period of four months, and with them, apparently intended to receive them, lay a large envelope, inscribed with an address in London that has since disappeared. Strong curiosity overcoming faint scruples, we read them by the dull glow of the burning juniper twigs, and, as we lay aside the last of them, there rose from the depths below us a wailing cry, and all night long it rose and died away, and rose again and died away again, whether born of our brain or of some human thing, God knows. And these, a little altered and shortened, are the letters. Extract from First Letter I cannot tell you, my dear Joyce, what a haven of peace this place is to me after the racket and fret of town. I am almost quite recovered already, and am growing stronger every day. And, joy of joys, my brain has come back to me, fresher and more vigorous, I think, for its holiday. In this silence and solitude, my thoughts flow freely, and the difficulties of my task are disappearing as if by magic. We are perched upon a tiny plateau, halfway up the mountain. On one side the rock rises almost perpendicularly, piercing the sky, while on the other, two thousand feet below us, the torrent hurls itself into the black waters of the fjord. The house consists of two rooms, or rather it is two cabins connected by a passage. The larger one we use as a living room, and the other is our sleeping apartment. We have no servant, but do everything for ourselves. I fear sometimes Muriel must find it lonely. The nearest human habitation is eight miles away, across the mountain, and not a soul comes near us. I spend as much time as I can with her, however, during the day, and make up for it by working at night after she has gone to sleep. And when I question her, she only laughs, and answers that she loves to have me all to herself. Here you will smile cynically, I know, and say, <laughs> I wonder will she say the same when they have been married six years instead of six months? 
At the rate I am working now, I shall have finished my first volume by the spring, and then, my dear fellow, you must try and come over, and we will walk and talk together amid these storm-reared temples of the gods. I have felt a new man since I arrived here. Instead of having to cudgel my brains, as we say, thoughts crowd upon me. This work will make my name. Part of the third letter, the second being mere talk about the book, a history apparently, that the man was writing. My dear Joyce, I have written you two letters, this will make the third, but have been unable to post them. Every day I have been expecting a visit from some farmer or villager, for the Norwegians are kindly people towards strangers, to say nothing of the inducements of trade. A fortnight having passed, however, and the commissariat question having become serious, I yesterday set out before dawn, and made my way down to the valley. And this gives me something to tell you. Nearing the village, I met a peasant woman. To my intense surprise, instead of returning my salutation, she stared at me, as if I were some wild animal, and shrank away from me as far as the width of the road would permit. In the village, the same experience awaited me, the children ran from me. The people avoided me. At last, a grey-haired old man appeared to take pity on me, and from him I learnt the explanation of the mystery. It seems there is a strange superstition attaching to this house in which we are living. My things were brought up here by the two men who accompanied me from Drontheim, but the natives are afraid to go near the place and prefer to keep as far as possible from any one connected with it. The story is that the house was built by one Hund, a maker of runes, one of the old saga writers, no doubt, who lived here with his young wife. All went peacefully until, unfortunately for him, a certain maiden stationed at a neighbouring satyr grew to love him. Forgive me if I am telling you what you know, but a satyr is the name given to the upland pastures to which, during the summer, are sent the cattle, generally under the charge of one or more of the maids. Here, for three months, these girls live in their lonely huts, entirely shut off from the world. Customs change a little in this land. Two or three such stations are within climbing distance of this house, at this day looked after by the farmer's daughters, as in the days of Hunt, maker of runes. Every night, by devious mountain paths, the woman would come and tap lightly at Hunt's door. Hunt had built himself two cabins, one behind the other. These are now, as I think I have explained to you, connected by a passage. The smaller one was the homestead. In the other he carved and wrote, so that while the young wife slept, the maker of runes and the satyr woman sat whispering. One night, however, the wife learnt all things, but said no word. Then, as now, the ravine in front of the enclosure was crossed by a slight bridge of planks, and over this bridge the woman of the satyr passed and repassed each night. On a day when Hunt had gone down to fish in the fjord, the wife took an axe and hacked and hewed at the bridge, yet it still looked firm and solid. And that night, as Hunt sat waiting in his workshop, there struck upon his ears a piercing cry, and a crashing of logs and rolling rock, and then again the dull roaring of the torrent far below. But the woman did not die unavenged, for that winter a man, skating far down the fjord, noticed a curious object embedded in the ice, and when, stooping, he looked closer, he saw two corpses, one gripping the other by the throat, and the bodies were the bodies of Hunt and his young wife. Since then, they say, the woman of the satyr haunts Hunt's house, and if she sees a light within, she taps upon the door, and no man may keep her out. Many, at different times, have tried to occupy the house, but strange tales are told of them. Men do not live at Hunt's satyr, said my old grey-haired friend, concluding his tale, they die there. I have persuaded some of the braver of the villagers to bring what provisions and other necessaries we require up to a plateau about a mile from the house, 
and leave them there. That is the most I have been able to do. It comes somewhat as a shock to one to find men and women, fairly educated and intelligent as many of them are, slaves to fears that one would expect a child to laugh at. But there is no reasoning with superstition. Extract from the same letter, but from a part seemingly written a day or two later. At home, I should have forgotten such a tale an hour after I heard it, but these mountain fastnesses seem strangely fit to be the last stronghold of the supernatural. The woman haunts me already. At night, instead of working, I find myself listening for her tapping at the door, and yesterday an incident occurred that makes me fear for my own common sense. I had gone out for a long walk alone, and the twilight was thickening into darkness as I neared home. Suddenly, looking up from my reverie, I saw, standing on a knoll the other side of the ravine, the figure of a woman. She held a cloak about her head, and I could not see her face. I took off my cap and called out a good night to her, but she never moved or spoke. Then, God knows why, for my brain was full of other thoughts at the time, a clammy chill crept over me, and my tongue grew dry and parched. I stood rooted to the spot, staring at her across the yawning gorge that divided us, and slowly she moved away and passed into the gloom, and I continued my way. I have said nothing to Muriel, and shall not. The effect the story has had upon myself warns me not to do so. From a letter dated eleven days later. She has come. I have known she would since that evening I saw her on the mountain, and last night she came, and we have sat and looked into each other's eyes. You will say, of course, that I am mad, that I have not recovered from my fever, that I have been working too hard, that I have heard a foolish tale, and that it has filled my overstrung brain with foolish fancies. I have told myself all that, but the thing came, nevertheless. A creature of flesh and blood? A creature of air? A creature of my own imagination? What matter? It was real to me. It came last night, as I sat working, alone. Each night I have waited for it, listened for it, longed for it, I know now. I heard the passing of its feet upon the bridge, the tapping of its hand upon the door three times. Tap, tap, tap. I felt my loins grow cold and a pricking pain about my head, and I gripped my chair with both hands and waited, and again there came the tapping. Tap, tap, tap. I rose and slipped the bolt of the door leading to the other room, and again I waited, and again there came the tapping. Tap, tap, tap. Then I opened the heavy outer door, and the wind rushed past me, scattering my papers, and the woman entered in, and I closed the door behind her. She threw her hood back from her head, and unwound a kerchief from about her neck, and laid it on the table. Then she crossed and sat before the fire, and I noticed her bare feet were damp with the night dew. I stood over against her and gazed at her, and she smiled at me, a strange, wicked smile, but I could have laid my soul at her feet. She never spoke or moved, and neither did I feel the need of spoken words, for I understood the meaning of those upon the mount when they said, Let us here make tabernacles. It is good for us to be here. How long a time passed thus, I do not know, but suddenly the woman held her hand up, listening, and there came a faint sound from the other room. Then swiftly she drew her hood about her face and passed out, closing the door softly behind her, and I drew back the bolt of the inner door and waited, and hearing nothing more, sat down, and must have fallen asleep in my chair. I awoke, and instantly there flashed through my mind the thought of the kerchief the woman had left behind her, and I started from my chair to hide it. But the table was already laid for breakfast, 
and my wife sat with her elbows on the table and her head between her hands, watching me with a look in her eyes that was new to me. She kissed me, though her lips were cold, and I argued to myself that the whole thing must have been a dream. But later in the day, passing the open door when her back was towards me, I saw her take the kerchief from a locked chest and look at it. I have told myself it must have been a kerchief of her own, and that all the rest has been my imagination, that, if not, then my strange visitant was no spirit, but a woman, and that, if human thing knows human thing, it was no creature of flesh and blood that sat beside me last night. Besides, what woman would she be? The nearest satyr is a three hours climb to a strong man, and the paths are dangerous even in daylight. What woman would have found them in the night? What woman would have chilled the air around her and have made the blood flow cold through all my veins? Yet, if she come again, I will speak to her. I will stretch out my hand and see whether she be mortal thing or only air. The Fifth Letter My dear Joyce, whether your eyes will ever see these letters is doubtful. From this place I shall never send them. They would read to you as the ravings of a madman. If ever I return to England, I may one day show them to you. But when I do, it will be when I, with you, can laugh over them. At present, I write them merely to hide away. Putting the words down on paper saves my screaming them aloud. She comes each night now taking the same seat beside the embers and fixing upon me those eyes with the hell-light in them that burn into my brain. And at rare times she smiles, and all my being passes out of me and is hers. I make no attempt to work. I sit listening for her footsteps on the creaking bridge, for the rustling of her feet upon the grass, for the tapping of her hand upon the door. No word is uttered between us. Each day I say, when she comes tonight, I will speak to her. I will stretch out my hand and touch her. Yet, when she enters, all thought and will goes out from me. Last night, as I stood gazing at her, my soul filled with her wondrous beauty as a lake with moonlight, her lips parted and she started from her chair, and, turning, I thought I saw a white face pressed against the window, but as I looked it vanished. Then she drew her cloak about her and passed out. I slid back the bolt I always draw now, and stole into the other room, and, taking down the lantern, held it above the bed. But Muriel's eyes were closed, as if in sleep. Extract from the Sixth Letter it is not the night I fear, but the day. I hate the sight of this woman with whom I live, whom I call wife. I shrink from the blow of her cold lips, the curse of her stony eyes. She has seen, she has learnt. I feel it, I know it. Yet she winds her arms around my neck and calls me sweetheart and smooths my hair with her soft, false hands. We speak mocking words of love to one another, but I know her cruel eyes are ever following me. She is plotting her revenge, and I hate her. I hate her. I hate her. Part of the Seventh Letter This morning I went down to the fjord. I told her I should not be back until the evening. She stood by the door, watching me, until we were mere specks to one another, and a promontory of the mountain shut me from view. Then, turning aside from the track, I made my way, running and stumbling over the jagged ground, round to the other side of the mountain, and began to climb again. It was slow, weary work. Often I had to go miles out of my road to avoid a ravine, and twice I reached a high point only to have to descend again. But at length I crossed the ridge, and crept down to a spot where, concealed, I could spy upon my own house. She, my wife, stood by the flimsy bridge. A short hatchet, 
such as butchers use, was in her hand. She leant against a pine trunk, with her arm behind her, as one stands whose back aches with long stooping in some cramped position, and even at that distance I could see the cruel smile about her lips. Then I recrossed the ridge and crawled down again, and, waiting until evening, walked slowly up the path. As I came in view of the house, she saw me and waved her handkerchief to me, and in answer I waved my hat and shouted curses at her that the wind whirled away into the torrent. She met me with a kiss, and I breathed no hint to her that I had seen. Let her devil's work remain undisturbed. Let it prove to me what manner of thing this is that haunts me. If it be a spirit, then the bridge wilt bear it safely. If it be woman... But I dismissed the thought. If it be human thing, why does it sit gazing at me, never speaking? Why does my tongue refuse to question it? Why does all power forsake me in its presence, so that I stand as in a dream? Yet, if it be spirit, why do I hear the passing of her feet? And why does the night rain glisten on her hair? I force myself back into my chair. It is far into the night, and I am alone, waiting, listening. If it be spirit, she will come to me. And if it be woman, I shall hear her cry above the storm, unless it be a demon mocking me. I have heard the cry. It rose, piercing and shrill, above the storm, above the writhing and rending of the bridge, above the downward crashing of the logs and loosened stones. I hear it as I listen now. It is cleaving its way upward from the depths below. It is wailing through the room as I sit writing. I have crawled upon my belly to the utmost edge of the still standing pier, until I could feel with my hand the jagged splinters left by the fallen planks, and have looked down. But the chasm was full to the brim with darkness. I shouted, but the wind shook my voice into mocking laughter. I sit here, feebly striking at the madness that is creeping nearer and nearer to me. I tell myself the whole thing is but the fever in my brain. The bridge was rotten. The storm was strong. The cry is but a single one among the many voices of the mountain. Yet still I listen, and it rises, clear and shrill, above the moaning of the pines, above the sobbing of the waters. It beats like blows upon my skull, and I know that she will never come again. Extract from the Last Letter I shall address an envelope to you, and leave it among these letters. Then, should I never come back, some chance wanderer may one day find and post them to you, and you will know. My books and writings remain untouched. We sit together of a night, this woman I call wife and I, she holding in her hands some knitted thing that never grows longer by a single stitch, and I with a volume before me that is ever open at the same page. And day and night we watch each other stealthily, moving to and fro about the silent house, and at times, looking round swiftly, I catch the smile upon her lips before she has time to smooth it away. We speak like strangers about this and that, making talk to hide our thoughts. We make a pretense of busying ourselves about whatever will help us to keep apart from one another. At night, sitting here between the shadows and the dull glow of the smouldering twigs, I sometimes think I hear the tapping I have learnt to listen for, and I start from my seat, softly open the door, and look out. But only the night stands there. Then I close to the latch, and she, the living woman, asks me in her purring voice what sound I heard, hiding a smile as she stoops low over her work, and I answer lightly, and, moving towards her, put my arm about her, feeling her softness and her suppleness, and wondering, supposing I held her close to me with one arm while pressing her from me with the other, how long before I should hear the cracking of her bones for here, amid these savage solitudes, I also am grown savage, 
the old primeval passions of love and hate stir within me, and they are fierce and cruel and strong beyond what you men of the later ages could understand. The culture of the centuries has fallen from me as a flimsy garment whirled away by the mountain wind. The old savage instincts of the race lie bare. One day I shall twine my fingers about her full white throat, and her eyes will slowly come towards me, and her lips will part, and the red tongue creep out. And backwards, step by step, I shall push her before me, gazing the while upon her bloodless face, and it will be my turn to smile. Backwards through the open door, backwards along the garden path between the juniper bushes, backwards till her heels are overhanging the ravine, and she grips life with nothing but her little toes, I shall force her step by step before me. Then I shall lean forward, closer, closer, till I kiss her purpling lips, and down, 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 past the startled seabirds, past the white spray of the foss, past the downward peeping pines, down, 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 we will go together, till we find the thing that lies sleeping beneath the waters of the fjord. With these words ended the last letter, unsigned. At the first streak of dawn we left the house, and, after much wandering, found our way back to the valley but of our guide we heard no news, whether he remained still upon the mountain, or whether, by some false step, he had perished upon that night, we never learned. End of The Woman of the Satyr Recording by Rafe Ball